Hi, I'm Atoll, a developer relations engineer on the Android team. I work with Wear OS primarily on tiles and watch faces. And I'm Yuri, a software engineer on the Wear developer team. With the recent and upcoming product changes in Wear OS, you might be feeling like it's a lot of work to build an entirely new app. And it would be if you had to do that. Luckily in this talk, Yuri and I will show you how you can leverage your existing mobile project to build a Wear app quickly and efficiently. Over the next 20 minutes, we'll show you what we're trying to build, our end goal. We'll demonstrate how a well-modularized project can get us halfway there and demonstrate how we plan to structure our code. Finally, we'll share some features from Horologist library, which can help us build the app quickly. We'll use a made up example, generic fitness, to provide context about the best ways that you can reuse the concepts, principles, and code with which you're already familiar. We won't dive into health and fitness APIs in this session. For more on that, look out for creating helpful fitness experiences with Brianna and Garen. Our imaginary app is a very simple fitness tracker with one idea. It wants you to do 150 minutes of moderate exercise every week. It helps you do this by keeping track of your workout and reminding you when you're falling behind. It's got two screens, one showing your history and past activities, and the other one for tracking an exercise. We learned from case studies on developer.android.com that other companies had success increasing engagement with their product by adding a Wear app. So that's the reason we're interested in building one for ourselves. We want it to work on its own. Our users shouldn't have to take their phone with them when they want to go to the gym or for a run, unless they want to. This means the app should be standalone, with the watch app syncing activities with our backend directly. It doesn't need to talk to the mobile app, and in fact, the user doesn't even need to have it installed. We don't really want to start coding this from scratch if we already have the mobile version, and the good news is we don't have to. The core functionality of the generic fitness app should be the same on Wear OS. Track exercises and see your weekly progress. So we should be able to reuse a lot of code and focus mainly on the UI. It is an app for Wear OS, though. So it should support Wear OS specific features like tiles and complications, features that don't exist on mobile. A complication is any feature that's displayed on a watch in addition to the time. So here on the watch face, we've got four of them. We've got the date at the top, the time in New York on the right, the user step count, and finally the weather. One of the use cases for the generic fitness app is to show the user's progress throughout the week, and complications work really well for this. We just have to provide the data. The watch face will render the UI, and we don't have to write it ourselves. Now the user can see how much they've achieved of their goal. And tapping it will open the app where they can see more detail. Adding a tile will also be a relatively low effort win. Tiles present information from one app at a time and live alongside the watch face, where each swipe will show a different tile. For generic fitness, we could add add one which lets the user start to work out quickly or see the weekly progress in more detail at a glance. For us, it's not a lot of effort to create, but it's something that users who like our app will want to see, and it's definitely something that they'll come to expect. In the next section, we'll take a look at how the generic fitness mobile app is currently structured and how this lends itself, where, <laughs> how this lends itself well to adding a Wear app that reuses a bunch of code. Yuri, tell us about modularization. The guide to Android app modularization is equally applicable to Wear. The goal is still the same. Split our project into loosely coupled self-contained modules. We'll take a look at what this means in practice and why it makes sense for Wear as well. But first, let's remind ourselves about our North Star. What do we want to achieve with our modularization strategy? A well-modularized app has lots of benefits, including the ones shown here. Scalability, encapsulation, reusability. The reusability aspect is, however, doubly true for Wear apps. If we have a single module for Wear or even a single module for mobile, we can't take advantage of the code that's already been written. Reusing the code here will lead to a consistent experience for the user and will reduce the risk of adding new bugs. In your project today, you'll have a top-level app module. It contains scaffolding classes that bind the rest of the code base, such as main activity, app class, top-level navigation. 
This depends on the this depends on UI modules, which usually correspond to a screen or a collection of closely related screens. UI modules depend on data modules. Data modules aren't tied to a particular screen. Instead, they encapsulate all the data and business logic for a particular domain or data type. For example, here, the overview module depends on both the historical and current exercise modules because it needs to display both for the overview screen. One benefit to this kind of structure is that you can use underlying modules as building blocks to create entirely new apps. Here, we added a new module, Exercise Demo, represented by this filled box. Exercise Demo can demo just the exercise screen in isolation. Everything else already existed. The result is the ability to build apps without having to duplicate code unnecessarily and crucially only contain the code that you need. For where, we recommend the exact same approach. Only add the code that you need. So here, we'll add a new app module for Wear. We also have to add new UI modules. Compose for Wear OS includes libraries which are optimized for the wrist, so we can't reuse the ones from mobile, and in any case, the screens are going to be different. The new UI modules can use the existing data modules because those are UI agnostic. And if we had a domain layer which can make it easier for the UI modules to access data, we could also share that between the mobile and Wear apps. There's no need to make it device specific. What we end up with is a Wear app writing relatively little code that's specific to Wear. And now Atul will look at how we can layer our app according to modern Android development guidelines. If you've watched the Mad Skills video series on architecture, the next few sections might seem familiar, and that's good. It's because the guidance is pretty much exactly the same. To avoid any confusion, though, I do want to highlight that there is already an API on Wear called the Wearable Data Layer. It's used for direct communication between the watch and the phone, but we're not referencing that in this talk. We want our Wear app to be completely standalone, so any syncing between devices needs to happen via the cloud using the internet. And all of this should happen using the data layer in your code base. So this data layer is the one where your application data lives. It's also where you're going to have the logic that determines how that data is fetched, stored, and updated. The entry point to the data layer is the repository. It's our interface to data sources, each of which work with a single source of data, for example, a local room database or a remote server. Let's take a look at the generic fitness mobile app and see what the data structure looks like there. We saw before that the mobile app has two main screens. This one gives an overview of sessions that you've already done. The other tab gives more detail about individual sessions. The data for this screen is accessible via the historical exercise repository. In this vertical slice of the generic fitness app, the repository is the entry point for the data layer, and it's through this repository that all the data operations will take place. It's backed by two data sources, the database, which is our source of truth, and a remote API so that we can sync completed sessions. The other screen in the fitness app is shown when you're currently tracking an exercise. It shows the user's heart rate and the elapsed time for the session. The data that we track during an exercise is significantly different from what we keep for a past exercise, so this is handled via the current exercise repository. It's backed by the Jetpack data store object, which stores metadata and metrics about the current exercise. And the heart rate data for the mobile app comes from a Bluetooth heart rate monitor, like one of those external chest straps. We create an Android service that has access to both the repository and the sensor data. The service ingests data from the sensor and can persist it via the repository. This lets our UI subscribe to metrics about the exercise without having to deal with the stream of data from sensors itself. And we should be able to use almost all of these classes for the Wear app. But what changes? So instead of an external heart rate monitor, we can use sensors built into the device via Wear Health Services, a platform-level library that can manage health metrics in a power-efficient way. Otherwise, the architecture is exactly the same and the code is reusable. And our UI on the watch this time will still subscribe to changes from the repository as it does on the mobile app, and it will read from the data store that's saved on the watch. For tiles and complications, though, we need a different solution. Like widgets on mobile, tiles and complications are periodically refreshed at intervals that you can specify. We want them to be up to date when an exercise is being performed, but we don't want to set the refresh period too short and wake our app unnecessarily. 
There's APIs we can use to request updates to tiles and complications, so we can call these APIs whenever there's new data. We made a class called Surface Updater that knows how to update these surfaces. Whenever it's told that there's new data, the Surface Updater can choose whether to request a refresh. Here's what it looks like. On exercise event is the public function that's called whenever there's new data. This class can decide whether to ignore it or not, for example, if one was recently requested. For complications, we can create an update request using the app context and the complication class name. And for tiles, there's a similar API as well. Other screens in our app are simpler and don't need anything specific for where, but it could still be worth refactoring to avoid a little to avoid duplicating code. In the next section, Yuri will describe how we can use domain level classes to combine data from multiple repositories. The domain layer is described as an optional layer in the modern Android development architecture guide. It sits between the UI and the data and is responsible for encapsulating business logic that's either complex or reused by multiple view models. Including a domain layer can help us avoid duplicated logic. In the generic fitness wear app, we want to display a chart showing the past week's progress. We also have a tile that shows the same chart with the same underlying data. And a complication and a tile that show each show the number of minutes exercised for the current week. All of these are representing the same data in different ways, but we don't want to duplicate the logic fetching in each of the uh, view models. So we have two options, push it down into the data layer, into the repository, or extract the logic into a new class. The problem with moving the logic into the repository is that the data we need comes from two different repositories. We want the historical data from the last seven days and data from the user's current exercise because we want to show the most up-to-date information. So for us, extracting the logic into a class makes sense, the get weekly progress use case. Now each one of the view models for the screens we showed just becomes easier to understand and test because they only have to interact with this one class. The use case itself has a single responsibility, to collate the weekly progress. It returns a flow of weekly progress report, which contains the information needed for us to render the UI. It emits a new weekly progress report whenever the current activity or a historical activity changes. We first fetch all historical sessions and combine it with the current session, if there is one. Now we have a single class that contains the logic to provide data, not just to the four different screens in the Wear app, but also the mobile app. Did we need to introduce a use case? No. When we just had the mobile app, it wasn't worth extracting the logic into, from the view model, and it worked just fine. But adding it helped us avoid copying that code four more times, so it made sense to refactor at this stage. Most of the new code you'll write for Wear OS will likely be UI. We can share most of the data and domain layers, but since your user journeys and UI code will be different depending on form factor, it's the one thing we really can't avoid. Since that's the case, let's focus on making it as easy as possible to develop and test. Apps for Wear OS can be written using Jetpack Compose. And just like Compose on mobile, the same best practices apply. For this screen, we're using a stateful composable that takes a view model as a parameter and remembers its state inside the function. It delegates to a stateless composable, also called weekly progress screen, where all the state is passed in explicitly. This one doesn't have a reference to the view model, and it doesn't maintain any state using remember constructs. Instead, it uses event handlers and state objects, which means it can be easily tested. Having a stateless composable means we can use it for previews in Android Studio and screenshot testing too. And now Atul to talk about Horologist. Horologist is a group of libraries that makes it easier to develop for Wear OS. It's got a toolkit for media, which Yuri and Kiara will present later in Building Media Apps for Wear OS. And it's also got support for high-quality pre-built composables. There's also several tools that facilitate code reuse within your Wear apps, tiles, and complications. In the last section, Yuri touched on the difference between stateful and stateless composables. We prefer composables that don't maintain their own state because we can use them for previews and screenshot testing. Even though tiles and complications don't use Compose, we can still apply the same principle using helpers from Horologist. Let's use tiles as an example. 
The Jetpack Tiles library provides tile service. It's the entry point for developing a tile, and it's what the SysUI will use to request your tile layout and your tile resources, for example, images. Suspending Tile Service is a coroutines-friendly friend, co wrapper from Horologist uh, that sits on top of Tile Service. It's not necessary to build a tile, but if you prefer coroutines over listenable futures, it's handy. And our tile, Weekly Progress Tile Service, is the concrete implementation. Horologist in introduces the concept of a tile layout renderer. Our concrete tile service delegates to its renderer, allowing us to move code out of what's essentially an Android service to another class that's completely synchronous, which means it's easy to test. Tile layout renderer isn't intrinsically complicated. It just has synchronous versions of the tile service functions with all state passes explicit parameters. The renderer is typed. You have to specify the types for both the layout state and the resource state. In this case, they're both the same. We need the weekly progress report state object to build and bind the layout, but we also need it to generate the image resources. Notice how the render tile function takes the state as a parameter and returns a layout. It doesn't manage its own state. This means it's easy to test, but we can also use it to generate previews in Android Studio. Previewing tiles for Wear OS used to be a bit of a pain. You can run your tile on an emulator or device, installing the app, adding the tile to the carousel, and swiping to it. The Jetpack Tiles library does include a tool which you can use to preview your tiles within the Android view system. This meant that you could have a debug activity that showed your tile without having to manually add it to the carousel, which was better. Android Studio Stable now has direct surface launching, so you don't even need that anymore. Instead of launching a debug activity, you can launch your tile directly and it'll install it to the carousel for you. With Horologist, though, you can preview your tile in Android Studio without launching it. It uses the tool from Jetpack Tiles and the Android View Composable to wrap the tile layout. So even though tiles aren't built with Compose, we can still leverage the tooling that's available to preview them. And because we have the tile layout renderer abstraction, we can just pass the state and it'll render in Android Studio. The chart, though, is another issue. How do you draw it? Neither Jetpack Tiles nor Tiles Material includes any canvas drawing APIs. But the same chart is used in the app where we use Compose for Wear OS. So can we reuse code here? Absolutely, we can. So the chart itself can be drawn using the, by creating a draw scope extension function, weekly progress chart, passing the weekly progress report as state. In the app, we can pass that draw scope extension to the canvas composable. And of course, we can preview it as well. But what about the tile? So I said before that tiles don't support Compose. So how do we get the chart there? We cheat, of course. So Horologist includes an API that takes the draw scope lambda, creates a bitmap, draws to it, and finally converts that bitmap to an image resource, which is the format that works with tiles. So while in our app, we pass the weekly progress chart function to a canvas composable, in our tile renderer, we can use the same function to create an image resource. So we covered a lot in the last 20 minutes, so let's recap. Starting with modularization, we recommend treating your wear and mobile app modules as hierarchical siblings and share underlying modules. Then we reiterated that the MAD architecture guidance applies to wear apps as well. If you've been following along with modern Android development, you can use everything that you've learned so far. Finally, we introduced some of the tools available in Horologist that can help you build using the concepts and principles that we shared today. Today's overview has hopefully reassured you that building apps for Wear OS is a lot more familiar than it might have seemed from the onset. If you're going to take away one thing from this session, let it be building blocks. Keep that in mind as you think about existing or new projects and how you can modularize your code base to facilitate reuse of code, not just across features, but across different form factors. Thank you.